Welcome to Psychology. Our first of notes is going to be the history of psychology, psychology how it developed into the science it is today. First, we're going to go all the way back a couple thousand years ago to the ancient Greeks. There's three main philosophers if you paid attention, paid attention in ancient history class, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. So Socrates was the first one, and then Plato was his student, and they kind of believed in the same thing. All right? So they both viewed the mind separate from the body. This is called dualism. All right, so that's important to know. All right, where the mind and body are separate is called dualism. That's what Socrates and Plato believed in. They also believed that you were born with pre-existing knowledge. This is called nature. All right, so that's important to know, especially nature and nurture. Um, there's a few people that believe in the different ones. You need to know which people believe in nature, which people believe in nurture. The first set of notes, we were talking about the history of psychology, so it's going to be a lot of people um, going back and, you know, some of the first theories that kind of started psychology. So you kind of need to know, like, the big things they believe in. So for Socrates and Plato, you need to know that they both believe in dualism and they both believe in nature. Remember, nature is that you're born with pre-existing knowledge. So the way you are, you're born that way. So Socrates was kind of original. Plato was his student. Socrates didn't write anything down, but Plato did. So he's written some books like The Republic, which is common for a lot of college freshmen to read. So you might have to read that in the coming years. And then Plato had a famous student called Aristotle. right? And he kind of believed in the opposite. So he used like scientific observation, and he concluded that mind and body are actually connected to each other, and that we learn from our environment. So learning from our environment is the opposite of nature. That's called nurture. So as Aristotle, you know, he's, he's observing how things are, and he knows that depending on your experiences, you act differently. All right, so that's where he kind of come up, comes with that conclusion of nurture. Aristotle actually had a famous student as well, not a famous Greek philosopher. Does anyone know who he is? Think about that for a second. In teaching psychology for over 10 years, I think I've only had one student actually get this right. I'll give you a hint. He was a famous general, never lost a battle. That's why he's known as one of the greatest generals of all time. He was Alexander the Great. All right, so a lot of famous people living, you know, together, right? So you got Socrates, and Plato was his student. Aristotle was Plato's student. And then Alexander the Great was actually a student of Aristotle. So remember the key things. Socrates and Plato believed in dualism. Mind and body are separate. And they believed in nature, that you're born with pre-existing knowledge. Aristotle believed that the mind and body are connected and that you learn from your environment, which is nurture. All right, so modern science, let's skip a couple thousand years. You have Rene Descartes. He agreed with Socrates and Plato about innate ideas and dualism. All right, so he believes in dualism as well. And he believes in innate ideas. Remember, innate means you're born with, right? So that would be, is that nature or nurture? If you said nature, you would be correct. So Rene Descartes believes in nature, and he believes in dualism. Charles Darwin is someone you've probably heard of before in your science classes because he believes in natural selection. So I'm sure you guys all heard of evolution, the book that he wrote, um, so he believed in natural selection, which is the process by which genetically heritable traits become more or less common in a population over successive generations. So any trait that you have that is an advantage to you, those traits are going to reproduce because they give you an advantage. So an example of this would be like during the Industrial Revolution in England, things became very polluted, things became darker, so the moss, the light colored moth actually started to die out because it stood out in like the black, dark background where the darker moss blended into all the pollution around it and actually survived. Right. So that would be natural selection. The next person is Sir Francis Bacon. He is known as the father of modern science. 
So you're going to see a, uh, two or three different fathers of this or fathers of that. Make sure you don't get them confused. He is the father of modern science because he established and popularized the method known as the scientific method. Right? It used to be called the Baconian method after him. You guys should have all heard of the scientific method. You pretty much have been taught it in every science class you've ever been in. And we'll talk more about that in the next set of notes when we talk about research. The last person on, on this slide is John Locke. He believed the mind was a blank slate, also known as tabula rosa, which means we're born without innate ideas. Remember, innate ideas means ideas you're born with, and that knowledge is gained by experience, right? This is also known as empiricism. So this is, is this nature or is this nurture? Think to yourself. If you said nurture, you are correct, right? So remember, nurture believes you learn from your environment. So that's what he's saying here, right? So you're born with a blank slate. You're not born with pre-existing knowledge. Everything you learn, you've learned through your environment, through your experiences that you've had. So a couple key words to remember that, so nurture could also be called other things, right? The blank slate, tabula rosa, and empiricism. So now moving on into a couple of different uh, schools of thought, right, or theories. One of the first ones with psychology and modern psychology is structuralism, right? This was developed by Wilhelm Wundt. Wilhelm Wundt is known as the father of psychology. That is extremely important to remember, right? So we talked about there's a couple different fathers you have to remember. The reason why he is known as the father of psychology is because in 1879, he created the first psychology lab. All right, so it's very important to know Francis Bacon is the father of modern science. Wilhelm Wundt is the father of psychology. A lot of people remember Wilhelm Wundt because he's German. So in German, you pronounce the W's like V's. All right, so I want to say Wilhelm Wundt that tends to stand out in your mind. So Wilhelm Wundt is the father of psychology for creating that first psychology lab. Wundt had a student named E.B. Titchener. They used something called introspection. All right, so that's a vocab word to know. Introspection. All introspection means is self-examination. So they use this technique to explore the structural elements of the mind, right? So this is why it's called structuralism. The problem with introspection is that people's experiences vary from person to person, and it's hard or almost impossible to know why we feel what we feel. So it's very important because it's important first step, right, in psychology. That's why he's called the father of psychology because, you know, he creates this lab. But yet we don't use this today because we don't really know what's going on inside our head or why, you know, these things are happening inside our head. And you, you got to think about person to person, they're going to vary on their responses. You might vary on your response from, you know, hour to hour, day to day, depending on your mood. So it's not as accurate as we would like it to be. But it's a very important, very uh, first step into psychology. Functionalism. So the main functionalist we talked about was William James. He focused on how our mental and behavioral processes function, how they enable us to adapt, survive, and flourish. All right, so that's why it's called functionalism. So pretty much all these different things we do, the way we act, the way we think, he said they each serve a purpose or a function. All right, so everything we do has a purpose to it. And so he explored, you know, what that purpose was or why we do that, right? What the function was of that behavior or of that mental process. Later on in the year, we're gonna do a unit called motivation emotion. And one of the theories in emotion is the James Lang theory of emotion. And so the James part of that theory is William James. So you can remember him for later on. You're gonna notice in psychology how things seem to pop up throughout the year, right? It kind of builds on, you know, each unit kind of builds on the last one. And so that's why it's very important to pay attention throughout. So Mary Calkins, there's only a couple of women we talk about in psychology and the history of it and pretty much throughout the year, um, which is definitely different now. In modern psychology, two thirds of people majoring in psychology are women, but that wasn't like that throughout the history of psychology. Mary Calkins is one woman that you definitely need to know. 
she was a uh, she applied to be a PhD student in psychology at Harvard. Well, James was the professor there, and he allowed her in the class. Right? This was not a popular decision because men and women did not take classes together at this time. So all the men dropped out. Right? So Mary Calkins took the class by herself, pretty much, just with William James. So at this time, women and men didn't even go to school together. So a lot of times, if you had a, well, there wasn't a lot of women in college at all. But if they were, they were usually at a separate college. So like Harvard had a sister school, just like Notre Dame had a sister school. So a lot of these schools, you know, they separated men and women. Even high schools were like that. You still, I think there's still even a couple high schools in Chicago like that right now. So she does all the work to get her psychology PhD. And Harvard says, no, we're not going to give it to you. So they offered her like a, a degree, sorry, a degree. And they offered her one from the sister school, but they refused to give her a Harvard PhD. So obviously she was not happy about this, but she didn't give up. She persevered. And later on, she becomes the first woman president of the APA in 1905. So that's extremely important to remember. The APA, you guys should have heard of before, like APA style of writing and citing. APA stands for American Psychological Association. So she is the first woman president of the AP, APA, and that is 1905. A couple other famous women, we have Margaret Floyd Washburn. She is the first woman to receive a PhD in psychology in 1894. So there's not a lot of women we talk about, like I said, don't get them confused, right? Washburn, first PhD. Mary Calkins, first APA president. So on your test, if it said she did this, please don't choose one of the male options. There's always students that do that. You know, use your test taking skills. Realize if it says she, the answer is going to be a woman, and it's probably going to be Washburn or Calkins. The other person is Ludding Hollingworth. So in 1920, she challenges the dogma that women are inferior to men. All right, so this is 100 years ago. It was common thought that women were inferior to men, not only physically, but also mentally. And so she challenges this. She says, if you give us a chance, we can do anything you can. We just need the chance to actually do it. And so you see a lot of women movements at this time. If you pay attention to U.S. history class, you would know this is the time that women got the right to vote. All right, turn of the century consciousness. So we talked about Vont, Titchener, James. The other main person that deals with consciousness is Sigmund Freud or Siggy as his friends call him. He's probably, even though he's been dead for like 80 years, almost 75 years, he is still probably the most famous psychologist, even though we don't use his theories that much anymore. And we'll talk more about that throughout the year. We'll be mentioning Sigmund Freud in most units throughout the year. So before he became a personality theorist, a psychologist, he was actually a doctor. All right, so he was a doctor and he was getting these patients they had these issues and his medical training could not answer, you know, the question of what was wrong with them. So that's why he, you know, eventually changed and became a personality theorist and became a psychologist. And like I said, we're going to talk a lot about his different theories throughout the year. But pretty much, you know, his he believed personality is shaped by unconscious desires, urges, feelings, things like that. Usually they were sexual in nature. All right, so it's these unconscious desires, these urges, these things you're not even aware of. You know, that's what motivates you to act the way you do, and that's why you have your personality. So when we talk, so he's the father of, like, psychodynamic theory, psychoanalysis. So one of the key words, whenever you hear psychodynamic, we're always talking about unconscious, right? Some type of urge, desire, feeling, things like that. So he's incredibly rich theory, but yet there's no scientific data to back it up. There's a lot of criticisms of Freud, um, you know, some of which he mainly only dealt with males, uh, he only studied sick people, right, people with mental illness. So he didn't study healthy people, which nowadays, you know, you say you got to study everyone. One of the main things about psychology nowadays is you have to predict what's going to happen. He doesn't do that. He looks after the fact, and then he comes up with an explanation of what was wrong with them or what caused that to happen. But it was always after the fact. And that's why, you know, we don't really, because psychology is such a science nowadays, we don't necessarily follow a lot of the theories that he came up with. But yet, you know, he's, like I say, still probably the most popular psychologist. You know, we have things like the Freudian slip, which that's where if you say something you didn't mean to, 
Freud, you'd be like, oh, no, you really didn't mean to say that. Like, if you said someone's name that you didn't meet to, you'd be like, oh, well, why did you say that person's name? Were they on your mind? You know, do you like them? You know, then he'd go down into the subconscious, the unconscious desires you might have for that person. Behaviorism. All right, so the next, you know, part of the history of psychology, we go from the consciousness to behaviorist from the 1920s, 1960s. It's actually a term coined by John Watson. And John Watson believed you could condition someone based entirely on experiences. So he did a very famous experiment called the Baby Albert Experiment. So you don't necessarily need to know the, every single detail of this experiment, but make sure you know that he did this, did this experiment and kind of what came out of it. So what he did, he got a nine-month-old baby and briefly exposed it to a white rat Rabbit, dog, monkey, burning newspapers, all kinds of different things. The baby had no fear, right? Baby was not scared of any of those things, right? Because fear is something you're taught, right? That's a, that's a nurture thing, like phobias people have. Most of those have been concluded to be nurture. You've learned to become scared of those things. So what he did, two months later, he brought that same baby back. Exposed them to all the same things, those white rats, all that stuff. But this time, he made a very loud noise as he exposed the baby to those objects. So after doing this a few times, the baby Albert started to associate the rat with the noise and became scared as he saw the rat. Right? Because loud noises are something you are naturally scared of. So now whenever he saw the rat and the other objects, he became scared because he associates the noise with the rat. So, you know, this is what he's talking about, how he can condition someone based entirely off experiences. He can make that baby afraid of something he wasn't before based off his experiences. And not only was the baby scared of the rat, but anything that reminded him of the rat. This is called generalization. All right, and this is, we're going to do a whole unit on learning at the end of the semester. And that's one of the terms we'll talk about generalization. How you're not only scared of the thing you learned about, but anything that reminds you of that as well. And you'll see this in the video that I'll post along with this is like he's scared of like stuffed animals. He even puts on this kind of creepy mask, you know, and he's scared of that. So, you know, that's generalization. Also with behaviorism, probably the most famous behaviorist is B.F. Skinner. So B.F. Skinner use something called the operant chamber or the Skinner box to train pigeons and rats to do all kinds of crazy things. And he used it with reinforcements, positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is the number one way you can train or get people to do what you want. In fact, a lot of students who were studying this realized how successful it was and actually loved psychology and became animal trainers because that's how animal trainers train animals. You notice how they feed them Whenever they do what they want, they're constantly feeding them. That is positive reinforcement. So that's what he, Skinner did. He trained pigeons to do all kinds of things. Play ping pong, which I'll post a video of that, where the pigeons actually like knock the ball back and forth. And whenever it scores a point, it gets a reward. So it's not holding paddles, but it hits the ball with its beak. Um, also, it taught it how to read and all other unnecessary kinds of things. So I'll post a video of pigeons reading. Uh, you'll see like a word come up and it'll do whatever the word says. If it says turn, it'll turn around and then it gets a reward. If it says peck, it starts pecking until it gets a reward. If you notice in this picture here, you see this pigeon reading a book called Pooping on People, 12 Easy Lessons. Uh, not only that, but during World War II, Skinner actually trained pigeons how to guide missiles. All right, so they actually were successful in guiding missiles to the target. Now, it was never actually used in battle. But yet he had successfully taught the pigeons how to do so, which is pretty uh, amazing if you think about it. So he's so John Washington kind of coins behaviorism, but Skinner is probably the most famous behaviorist with all the different things that he did.